Next up, we have Dr. Paul Ulig, and he is a cardiothoracic surgeon from Wichita, Kansas. Susan and John there representing in the house. Um, his title is, Let Us Now Praise Famous Pioneers, The Life and Contributions of Dr. Gerald Buckberg. We all know that name very well, right? Buckberg Cardioplegia. Uh, what a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and and uh, Ms. Cornelius, thank you so much for your presentation. It was uh, so important. Um, I'm honored to be here. This, this little picture on my desktop, that's like the new world of healthcare waiting to be created. Um, and I think it's going to be built on a lot of the principles that she was telling us about. Um, and today, I'm going to go back in time a little bit to talk a little bit about history. So... Oh, let me get, okay, so you got that. So let me um, just uh, ask you all, uh, how many here uh, feel comfortable with Buckberg cardioplegia? So quite a number of hands, maybe two thirds. Um, and how many of you use Del Nido regularly? So at least as many or more. How many people use Buckberg regularly? Um, so probably switching over toward Del Nido. It's really interesting looking at that at those numbers. Um, so this talk is going to touch on on all of those. Um, I just have a little bit of a different presentation, could, sir. Could you just help me uh, how I get my ordinary uh, picture up here? Yeah, I would like just the ordinary. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I mean, okay, well, I can do it with this. It'll be fine. Thank you. All right. So, um, the title of my talk is, Let Us Now Praise Famous Pioneers, The Life and Contributions of Dr. Gerald Buckberg. So um, looking around this room, I'm not sure how many of you have ever met Dr. Buckberg or really knew him in his prime. Probably most of you haven't. Um, he's, he was really quite an amazing person. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about him through this talk. So I don't have anything to disclose regarding this. Uh, however, I have a whole lot of people to thank. There are people very much like you. I work at the Kansas Medical Center in Wichita, uh, Kansas, um, and these are some of the folks from our operating room. I know you all uh, have people that you love as much as I love these folks. Um, our three perfusionists are there in your upper right, uh, Richard Henning, Danny Coyne, and our newest member, uh, John Englert, uh, some of you know John now, and uh, so it's just a, a pleasure to be here with you. I have just the deepest respect for them and for your entire profession. It's a, just a great privilege for me to be here uh, with you today. So in putting this talk together, these are just some of the sources. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, kind of uh, memoir that Dr. Buckberg wrote called Solving the Mysteries of Heart Disease. Uh, I drew a lot from that. There uh, is a, uh, uh, an obituary that was written and published in many of our surgical uh, uh, journals uh, simultaneously from Richard Scheman. Um, and that you can search so much on the internet. There's a wealth of published articles, most of which are in public domain now, if you want to read more about this. I got to know Dr. Buckberg in the 1990s as I became really interested in his methods. And he was very approachable. I called him up and uh, we became actually very good friends, and so I learned a lot directly from him. And then I supplemented that with additional conversations uh, with some of his uh, contemporaries. And then for 30 years, I've been using Buckberg's methods as accurately as I can from what he in instructed me. Uh, and I've had just extraordinary results. Um, my STS outcomes are usually about one-third of predicted 
in terms of mortality, and I attribute a huge amount that to to following to the letter uh, the instructions that uh, Dr. Buckberg gave us. So uh, here's what I see when uh, I look around this room. I see extraordinary people who have bulging bags of tricks for solving just about any kind of problem that can occur in the operating room. Uh, the, the challenges that I make, you all are going to help figure out how to get out of. Um, and so in this area of cardioplegia, there are so many potential bags of tricks. Uh, some older, such as uh, fibrillation, some uh, newer, uh, some newest. Uh, and uh, so this talk focuses mostly on Buckberg, but I'd love for you to think about all of these uh, as we go through this talk. So here are my objectives today. Uh, first is to deepen your bag of tricks regarding Buckberg cardioplegia. I'd like to talk a little bit about understanding myocardial protection at a cellular level, the importance of maintaining metabolism in that heart while you're working on it, the protecting and replenishing its energy stores, preventing ischemic calcium influx. We'll talk a lot more about that. And the critical role of controlled reperfusion, something that was really foundational to Dr. Buckberg, but not always understood uh, by um, many of us practicing it. Um, understanding that when we say Buckberg cardioplegia, we're really talking about a complete stepwise methodology for myocardial protection. It's not just a solution that you infuse. And then a little historical information about Dr. Buckberg as a surgeon and a scientist, the research he did and some of his other interests beyond cardioplegia. And at the end of the day, I hope that you will protect your hearts even better because of this talk. So who was Jerry Buckberg? Well, I, probably you all have heard of James Cox, like Cox Maze and so forth. He gave an introduction to uh, uh, Dr. Buckberg in Dr. Buckberg's memoir. And he starts off by saying, Gerald Buckberg is a level one. And he said, what I mean by that is he said, I, I was invited to give a talk in uh, Germany. And as I was going there, I happened to uh, meet a mathematician, one of the most esteemed mathematicians uh, in Europe. And he was talking about three levels of, of a kind of intellectual capacity. He said, most mathematicians are level three. They're very bright. They solve all sorts of good stuff. But they cannot do level two or level one work. He said, at any given time, there's probably 30 or 40 level two mathematicians um, doing more than the ordinary. But he said, there's usually just at any given time in the world, there's usually one level one mathematician. An example would be Niels Bohr or Albert Einstein. Uh, people that just have an inside and intellectual capacity that just exceeds all of us mere mortals. And he said, as far as he knows, in his lifetime, the only level one intellect that we've had in cardiac surgery has been Jerry Buckberg. Like, wow, to have James Cox saying that about somebody. So it gives you a little pause. So Jerry Buckberg was born in 1935. He grew up in the Bronx. Uh, I don't know very much about the Bronx being from Wichita, Kansas. But uh, so I had to read about it. And I found this really fun article is, uh, what the heck is the Bronx anyway? Um, it's bordered by the Harlem and East Rivers, and it's considered the home of rap and hip hop, as well as the uh, home of the New York Yankees. It contains the poorest congressional district in the United States, and it was known throughout the 20th century for its poverty and crime. However, it has since emerged as one of the most ethnically diverse and culturally rich boroughs in New York City. Jerry used to say, hey, you know, all this stuff I've been doing, this is not so bad from a guy from the Bronx. He, he was born there, he grew up there. Um, when it came time for college, he decided he wanted to be a dentist. And he followed uh, one of his cousins to Ohio State University. And uh, he um, got in the dental lab and he went, I don't wanna do this. And uh, so he started looking around and he just kind of fell in love with cardiac physiology and uh, a whole uh, pathway was set. He went to the University of Cincinnati for medical school. He graduated in 1961, number one in his class. Uh, he went on for his uh, residency 
uh, first at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and at that time, uh, Blaylock and the other like luminaries were still there. Uh, and he left there then to go to what people often referred to at the time as Hopkins West, which was UCLA. Um, and he uh, finished his general surgery and cardiac training there at UCLA. He then had a couple years of active duty in the Air Force. This is right in the middle of the Vietnam War. Uh, and then he had a very formative two years at University of California, San Francisco at the Cardiovascular Research Institute. And then he went from there to where he remained his entire professional uh, career back to UCLA uh, at what eventually became known as the David Geffen School of Medicine there at UCLA. Now, <clears throat> at the CVRI, uh, and he was there for two years, his mentor was a pediatric cardiologist named Julian Hoffman. And I know about this because I spent two years, 10 years later at the CVRI with Dr. Hoffman and he was one of the most brilliant researchers that you could ever imagine. And he taught this foundational approach to research that just imprints you. Uh, and Jerry said that Dr. Hoffman uh, taught me how to respond to data that I collected through research, how to look at it, find the new questions stimulated by the data, and answer those questions in a way that provided reasons for everything I was asserting. And above all, Dr. Buckberg was a scientist. Uh, I'm not a scientist, I am a heart surgeon. Uh, and, and I'm also a pilot, by the way. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not really a scientist. I'm a thoughtful observer, but Dr. Buckberg was a true scientist and Dr. Hoffman helped him become that. In his memoir, Dr. Buckberg writes, at CVRI, we wanted to solve the mystery that had been plaguing me and others. Why were so many open heart surgery patients not surviving? even though their operations had been done in a technically perfect way. So this is his first major paper published with Dr. Hoffman about four years after he left the CVRI. Uh, and it's about subendocardial ischemia. Now, most of you know that if you have a hypertrophied heart, uh, that its energy demands are way different than a non-hypertrophied heart. And if you lower the hematocrit or if you lower the blood pressure and you create certain loading conditions on that heart, because of that big muscle bound heart, the inner layers of that heart wall are not gonna get the same perfusion that the rest of the heart wall does. And it's gonna be harmed. And in fact, it might even die. And so they worked that out and came up with calculations for supply and demand for that inner layer that allowed people to predict when that heart was going to suffer. And it was a huge contribution, and many of the methods then he carried forward into all of his cardioplegia work. So when he finished at the CVR, he was uh, a new, young assistant professor just coming back to the faculty at, at UCLA. And his uh, chief, uh, James uh, Maloney, uh, had a very established lab uh, for researching things such as what Dr. Buckberg eventually did. And Dr. Buckberg said, hey, you know, I, I'm a little bit apprehensive about this because I know that you got to publish all these papers and I'm just not quite sure. And Dr. Maloney took him aside and said, look, just whatever you need, we'll give it to you. We believe in you. And we've got a problem for you because uh, we're having patients die in here. And by the way, it's even worse than a lot of other places because we cannot go fast because we're trying to train residents. We've got to go slower. And at that time, the total belief was that safety was in speed. Um, and Dr. Buckberg uh, thought about that and he said, you know, that was the belief that time was the enemy, but I explained that the true problem wasn't speed. Instead, the basic issue was how well you protected the heart during the procedure. From the CBR, I knew what to look for and I had the tools to measure what was happening I was eager to embark on a detective's path that might un uncover the cause for a major worldwide problem. I was on a mission, and he absolutely was. So this is the evolution of the way that they protected hearts at UCLA during this interval of time from 1971 to 1978. I was wondering, has anybody ever used ventricular fibrillation uh, for doing an operation? So I see some hands. So maybe you're closing a PFO or an ASD, or maybe you've got a mitral valve that for whatever reason you can't cross clamp or, or whatever else. So fibrillation is something that we every once in a while do, 
but it used to be one of the absolute mainstays for producing a quiet uh, field. Um, and um, people moved from that because of the complications and problems that, including subendocardial ischemia, to what was called intermittent cross clamp. Does anybody ever do intermittent cross clamp? Um, so some of you do. And the surgeon will just put the clamp on, the heart will beat down, you'll work for about 10 or 15 minutes, you'll take the clamp off, the heart will wake back up again. After about 10 minutes, you put the clamp back on again. I just cringe to think of all the trash that I'm sending to the brain or whatever else with every one of those things. And that poor little heart just going like, you know, I mean, it's just like, okay. But that's what they were doing because it was the best they knew. And so Dr. Buckberg started working with that. He said, all right, let's take these things. We know this is causing problems to the heart, but let's make sure we keep our pressure up and our hematocrit up and so forth. And he was able to dramatically reduce the injury that was happening to the hearts. And he was so excited about that. And in 1975, he went to uh, one of the AATS meetings and he presented to an, a room full of, you know, several thousand cardiac surgeons about these advances. And he was so proud of it. And the next guy that got up was a guy named Rodewald, who was from Germany. And he said, you know, you can do all that. But he said, I've been using this stuff called cardioplegia. And it is way better. And it like blew Jerry's mind. And so he came back just from like the high of his presentation to the low of like, wow, there's an even better way. But his curiosity was there. And so he started, he redirected his whole laboratory research. And first he went crystalloid cardioplegia because that's what people were doing. And then he developed this idea that you could actually mix that crystalloid in with blood so that you could oxygenate. And so blood cardioplegia came out of his work. And then finally on to the last steps of what he calls controlled reperfusion. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So um, this is a paper that he wrote in 1979. Uh, if you want to read one paper, it would be uh, really a good paper because it's this turning point in history, summarizing everything that's gone before and looking forward to what's coming. But it's really thinking about these things at the cellular level. Um, and uh, this, uh, these are the uh, subheadings in that paper, supply, demand, consequences of ischemia. And it just goes through all these elements and it'll take you about like one evening but it will make you totally 10 times smarter about what's happening in your operating room with cardioplegia. Well, a few places began applying his methods. And one of those places uh, was University of Alabama, Dr. Kirkland, many of you know his name and his work. But so this is from a paper that he published in 1990. Uh, it was actually addressed to the European, one of the European societies, but the blue line is the uh, outcomes that they were getting with their old methods. And it, you can see it's completely time dependent. Uh, the longer that you were on cross clamp, the more likely it was you were to die. And then this revolutionary change, this flat red line at the bottom of the screen, time no longer matters and almost nobody's dying. And it is in these methods that Dr. Buckberg uh, developed. So just look at that red line for a minute and think about it because like it removes time from our equation. And I put this little guy, this Felix the cat up there because like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Takes time away. Um, you know, hey, we all know faster is better, okay? I get to go home. I can send for the next case. And most important, it's better for the patient, isn't it, when I'm going fast? So it's kind of like an identity thing for us in cardiac care. Certainly for most surgeons that I know, it's deeply rooted in our culture. The best surgeons are the fast surgeons. Well, guess what? If you look closely at Dr. Buckberg's data, that's not true. Taking time for optimum protection is better for the patient. The data is crystal clear about this, but you've got to do that protection right. Okay, so this is me going like, wow, myocardial protection is the foundation of our operation. If I protect this heart well, it doesn't matter how long I take, I can do exactly a perfect anatomic correction. I can, you know, just like, and it totally changed my life. It changes everything. So this idea that our care and our technical precision, our complete correction we're gonna do 
They're on a foundation of myocardial protection. So here's a foundation, and here's another foundation. And so being here in Florida, like, which one do you want when the hurricane comes? You know, so like, I think I know which one I'd like. So what is that foundation? What is Buckberg cardioplegia if that becomes your foundation? Well, it's a strategy, and it's a technique, and it's a solution. Most people, at least most surgeons that I know, or certainly those surgeons who've trained recently, they know Buckberg as a solution. They know it as a, a liquid that we're going to pump, just like Del Nido is a liquid we're going to pump. And Del Nido is like 10 times easier because we just pump it once, or maybe we pump it twice. And this Buckberg thing, we got to do it every 20 minutes. I'm like, oh, God, I'm wearing out. But it's really more than a solution. It's a strategy. So the strategy is that you're going to prepare for your arrest by optimizing energy stores. That's what warm, warm reperfusion is about. You're going to flood that heart with all the things it needs to just like make it really fat and happy before it goes to sleep. And then you're going to keep washing out these metabolites and replenishing those energy stores and keeping the heart cool to reduce its demand. And then when it comes time to wake it back up again, you're going to bring that cellular metabolism back online in a stepwise way. You're going to lower the calcium before you let the normal blood back in. And you're going to allow that heart to rest and recover before you ask work of it. And our goal is complete metabolic and functional recovery. Now, the technique are things that you already know, anagrade and retrograde, because either one doesn't go every place in the heart. Systemic cooling, not very much, really, because you want that blood to be metabolically active to help support the patient. Uh, warm induction if the heart's stressed, or even, as I use it, for every case, because, hey, why not? Um, Single cross clamp, alternating proximal and distal, so that as you add each graft in, you're getting your cardioplegia to all those places that couldn't get it before. Each completed graft adds to your protection. And then the specific composition of the reperfusate. One of my young partners the other day had absolutely no idea that it mattered what went in the hot shot. He's just like, well, it's to warm it up, right? No, absolutely not. It's like 10 years of his whole research and life was in what is in that 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 cardioplegia so you know the bags and i'm not going to go into too many of those but each one of them has been carefully worked out the compositions of that over 10 years in the lab and it's a whole bunch of stuff but each one has a specific purpose the fam is there to buffer the acidosis that's developing with anaerobic glycolysis the glutamate aspartate or krebs cycle intermediates that are precursors for the metabolism the CPD limits that calcium reflux, the influx that can kill the heart and so forth. Every one of these things is there for a specific reason. And this is, was very sobering when I saw it. These are electron micrographs of a normal, uh, you know, the, in, the intracellular structures, the mitochondria, the energy heart of heart cells. Uh, and you see the normal structure on top. You see normal structure after ischemia followed by controlled reperfusion so that you're lowering um, uh, the uh, calcium as this begins. And you can see it's almost intact. And then the bottom one is what happens if you just make the heart ischemic and then you let normal blood flow back in, take the cross clamp off. It's like you throw a bomb in those mitochondria. And it's really in that controlled reperfusion that Buckberg cardioplegia lives. So what about Del Nido? Well, it's really cool, and I'm really interested in Del Nido, and I'm not trying to say you shouldn't use it, but I am saying you might want to be thoughtful about it. Um, there are several really interesting papers. Um, this is a, a relatively recent paper from a couple years ago looking at 173 Del Nido patients that had very long cross-clamp times. You see 208 minutes, um, and their outcomes... 66% uh, of patients had arrhythmias, dialysis required in 10%, strokes in 5%, pacemaker in 20%, new right ventricular dysfunction in 33 patients, um, mechanical circulatory support required in 22% of patients. It's like, holy moly. Now, here's back from 20 years ago, a similar kind of patient population with Buckberg. Bottom of that paragraph, no patients died, 15% required inotropes, none required an intra-aortic balloon pump for the same rough lengths of 
cross clamp and so forth. So it just makes you think a little bit. Um, this is a paper that Dr. Buckberg wrote, one of his last papers. He just said, you know, just be sure you're comparing apples to oranges. Because a lot of times when people say, oh, we use Buckberg cardioplegia or modified Buckberg cardioplegia or blood cardioplegia compared to the Del Nido, he said a whole lot of those studies, they didn't really use our cardioplegia and they didn't really use our methods. So you just have to be thoughtful about it. One of Dr. Buckberg's main collaborators is a pediatric cardiac surgeon named Brad Allen. He wrote a really interesting paper here in uh, 2019. He just said, hey, you know, we used to go to the meetings and a third of the presentations were about myocardial protection. He said, you don't even see that anymore. He said, we need to do it again. So just something to think about. So Dr. Buckberg did a whole bunch of other stuff, but nothing really stuck like the uh, cardioplegia did. He died September 20th of uh, 2018, a true loss to our profession. He left some really interesting things. He, every one of these things hasn't caught on yet. He was very interested in the helical structure of the heart. In fact, he, he created a ballet uh, about the helix of the heart, and you might enjoy searching on that and watching his. So I just wanted to close. A whole lot of my work uh, has been in something in addition to myocardial protection. So I told you myocardial protection was the foundation, but in honor of uh, Ms. Cornelius, I'd like to say that I really think that cohesive teamwork and communications are the bedrock of what we do. Uh, and uh, that's it. So.